Hey guys, it's Sporting88. In this video, I'm going to be presenting you my masterclass on drag clicking. I basically explain to you everything I know about drag clicking capabilities, why certain mice are better than others, etc. This is basically an eight month piled paper and I hope you enjoy. Before I get into like the technical and confusing parts of drag clicking, I think it'll be imperative to first begin with what drag clicking is and what drag clicking is used for. So obviously, you guys here already know what drag clicking is, but I need to go into more detail. Let's start from the very beginning, a little history of drag clicking, if you will, or rather absurd clicking methods. I'm going to assume that you already know what gaming mice are used for and what left and right clicks are, and if you don't, I have no idea why you're watching me. But that's besides the point. I got you covered. So such gaming mice look like this. This is the Zowie S2 matte black version. You guys probably haven't seen this before. You only know Glorious, Rocat, and Bloody, and like Logitech or something. Here's the left click, and here's the right click. Obviously, you already know what those are. So let's start with section zero, background to drag clicking. In the game of Minecraft, clicks per second are required to perform a variety of actions. For example, left click CPS is required for player versus player combat, while right click CPS is required to place blocks. So there seems to be a consensus in the competitive Minecraft community that High CPS is necessary for success, right? Ranging from 12 to 30 CPS. In other words, the more CPS you have, the more advantage you have. You're able to reduce knockback, clutch easier, and like god bridge, etc. So it only makes sense that in the competitive micro community, we'll come up with clicking methods to reach the highest CPS. Notably, and the more common clicking methods include bar fight clicking, which is clicking with two fingers in succession, jitter clicking, which is tensing up your forearm and spazzing it to register clicks. Other methods include brawl clicking, Fidget spinner clicking, lip clicking, frying ball clicking, chainsaw clicking, race car clicking, serial clicking, and boat clicking. I will not explain these as they are unconventional clicking methods, right? No one uses them in real gameplay. So in the past few years, a clicking method known as drag clicking, probably originating from the competitive German community, emerged due to the resurgence of Minecraft. That basically boosted the drag clicking community indirectly. So as Bedless Noob and Tainator grew along with a few other channels like Krennic, Dougal, Telebridger, Misdemeanors, Sante, flowers, the competitive Minecraft and drag clicking community flourished. So now we know a bit of history behind this clicking method, what is drag clicking? Now we begin with the paper. Section 1, what is drag clicking? So drag clicking is using your finger, namely your middle or index finger, to rub against the surface of a mouse button, which will then move your mouse button up and down many times physically to actuate lots of clicks. So here's a metaphor for what drag clicking can be envisioned to be. Say you have a stringed instrument like a violin. When you play on the violin string using a bow, the string will vibrate, producing a melodious sound. The mouse button can be analogous to a violin string, and the finger can be analogous to the bow pulling on the violin string. Do you see it? The button is vibrating, and you're producing those vibrations via the forceful rubbing of your finger against the mouse button. And as a result of the vibrations of those mouse buttons, you're actuating lots of CPS. So there are lots of many different factors that affect drag clicking capabilities, namely two things. Drag clicking is bound to the mouse itself, whether the mouse is capable of registering those clicks, and drag clicking is bound to the user of the mouse, whether the user is drag clicking correctly or not. So you can basically, in other words, improve drag clicking on your end or on the mouse's end. So section 1a, improving drag clicking on a user's end. This is what lots of people talk about in like drag clicking tutorials. To improve drag clicking on your end, you have to increase the friction or decrease the friction of the surface of a mouse button or on your fingers. Right? In general, the more friction you have, the more vibrations you're able to produce between your fingers and the mouse button. More vibrations meaning more CPS while drag clicking. So as you've seen through many tutorials, obviously, people put like the sticky part of the tape on their fingers to increase friction on that surface. People wash their hands, wipe down their mouse button to decrease the friction on the surfaces. You know, like sometimes you have like oils on your hands and that as a result decreases friction. People put like grip tape. Sometimes they buy like razor grip tape, glorious grip tape, lizard skins, hotlines, dragons, etc. Some people put electrical tape from like different brands or try scotch tape, masking tape, or like silicon tape to increase the friction of the surface of the mouse button. So most arguably, the most effective tape according to the community is grip tape and electrical tape, though it will be different for everyone. Friction is dependent on temperature, humidity of your room, the dirt and oils on your hands, the dirt and oils on your mouse button, the material of your mouse button, the material of your tape, the mouse shell, etc. Section 1b, improving drag clicking on a mouse's end. 
So this is where things get interesting. This is probably things that you've never seen before. To improve drag clicking on a mouse's end, right? Drag clickers usually buy a certain gaming mice that are able to register the clicks. After all, not all mice are created equal. Some mice can register the clicks better than others, while some cannot register drag clicks at all. That is to say, all mice have different capabilities based on their software, switches, processor, sensor, shape, etc. Some mice have long mouse buttons which are perfect for long dragging, while others don't. For example, if you compare like the Rocat Cane to like the Moto O, the Moto O has like a honeycomb design, and as a result, it's hard to long drag unless you have electrical tape, but the Rocat Cane has perfectly long buttons, which is perfect for long dragging. Some mice have extreme button wobble which affects your drag clicking capabilities, while others don't. For example, if you compare the Mad Cat's Mojo, which has extreme button wobble, versus the Blade A70, which has no button wobble, you can see the CPS difference. Some mice have perfect surfaces for drag clicking, like matte surfaces, while some are glossy and you cannot, like, I guess, drag click on them unless you use other materials such as paint tape on them. Examples of this include the glossy Moto O versus the matte Moto O. Lastly, some mice have better shell flex than others and switch tensioning. For example, if you compare the Bloody A60 to the Bloody A70, I heard people say that the Bloody A60 has a lighter switch and a better texture. It can be attributed to a better shell material and it can be attributed to less tensioning in the switch, which is better for drag clicking. So why is that? Why are certain mice better than others? Section 2, the science, right? What affects drag clicking capabilities? The first factor is called micro switch. Micro switches are basically how the mouse is able to register clicks at all. When you press down on a mouse button, you hear a click. That is the micro switch being pressed. So micro switch companies include Omron's, Kale's, Huano's, Zippy's, TTC's, Razor's, Honeywell's, and ZF Cherry's. There are many different types of micro switches. Some are mechanical, some are optical, some are harder to double click on, and some aren't. Though before I continue, I have to classify those as DC preventative as switches with high operating force slash actuation force and tensioning. In other words, some switches aren't able to register high amounts of CPS due to the nature of the switch. As you know, there are three ways to double click, the use of a macro, accidental double click, and physical double clicks. So some switches are hard to physically double click on due to their actuation force. Notable examples include Pono's and Kale's, and thereby are worse at registering drag clicks. Therefore, we have to avoid mice with these types of switches, or we replace the micro switches via desoldering. So generally mice with micro switches that are physically easier to double click on, like the 20 million or 50 mil Omron switches are the best for drag clicking. However, switch type is not the only thing that affects the registration of clicks. Luckily for us, if you do own a mouse with a heavy switch, like a zippy switch or a Huano blue shell white dot switch, as the switch wears down, the operating force, return force, and the leaf spring tends to become less, and hence it will become easier for you to register your drag clicks. There's also a misconception that I believed in and many people believed in that optical switches cannot register the drag clicks or double clicks. That is not entirely true and I'll explain why in the next factor. So the next factor that affects a mouse's ability to register drag clicks is called debounce time. Everyone heard about this. So what is debounce time? Here's a metaphor. Say you have a metal plate in front of you, right? Thick metal plates and you struck it with a hammer. That plate, even though it was hit once, will keep on vibrating and then it'll go to a full stop eventually. So this is the same thing that happens inside a micro switch. Basically, when you click down on your switch, the metal contact will bounce just like in a metal plate, and this causes accidental clicks. So in other words, if you click once, right, maybe it'll register four to five accidental clicks due to the nature of a mechanical switch. However, there's this misconception that those bounces are drag clicks, and those aren't. I'll explain those why soon. In order to, I guess, filter out these accidental clicks, mice with mechanical switches use something called debouncing. In other words, they try to filter out those accidental clicks caused by micro switch itself. So there are two ways to filter out these accidental bounces, hardware debouncing and software debouncing. Mice generally do a combination of both, but mainly rely on software debouncing. As of currently, I only know of one mouse that strictly uses hardware debouncing. It is the Mojo M1. I made a video on that if you want to see it. Besides that mouse, other gaming mice like Logitech, Glorious, SteelSeries, Corsair generally use software debouncing along with the use of capacitors. The rule of thumb is that the mice with the lowest debounce times, aka the lowest filtering capabilities, are able to register drag clicks. So as you see, right, most companies have too high of a debounce time, meaning that they filter out the real clicks 
clicks, not just the accidental bounces, but the real clicks caused by drag clicks. So as a result, you have to look for mice with the lowest debounce times. But how do you do that? Companies usually don't tell us, except like a glorious ponage and some other mice. They don't have an incentive to tell us the debounce time because their consumer base isn't drag clickers. So we have to use predictors of debounce time via certain tests. One of the predictors I used was called click latency, aka how long it takes for a click to be registered. Click latency isn't 100% debounce time, but it's a good indicator of it. For example, in general, the more click latency you have, the more debounce time a mouse has. However, it doesn't work when you reverse this statement. So when you say the less click latency means less debouncing, this statement begins to fail. Some mice actually have low click latency but high debouncing and artificial delays. So we're forced to use a different predictor, hold and release delays, aka the minimum duration of clicks and the minimum time between clicks. According to Ellen from Mouse Review, a hold delay is an artificial hold state that makes the click register as a click for X amount of time after activation. In other words, this is the minimum duration of a click. And release delay is a delay after the click down to adjust for aftershock bounce. This is the minimum time between clicks. The other delays that constitute debounce times, right? Debounce time is only part of the picture, right? And it's very limited. It's too broad of a term. Hence, we use something called hold and release. To give you a more visual example, let's talk about Logitech mice. Logitech mice usually use some form of an Omron switch, whether it be plated or not. But Logitech mice have low click latencies, but they have high software debouncing. So Logitech mice have 22 milliseconds minimum click duration and 22 milliseconds minimum time between clicks. So if you add those two delays together, you can find the total delay and that is 44 milliseconds hold and release delay. So we can actually find the theoretical max CPS of any mice by dividing one second by all these delays I, I mentioned earlier. So you could do 1000 divided by 44 to go around 22.7 max clicks per second. Most Logitech mice are the same in drag clicking capabilities and that's around 22 to 23 CPS and it really ranges. Um, you could do plus or minus CPS. The CPS capabilities of a Logitech mouse will usually range due to other debouncing things that I won't get into. They're just too complicated to explain. So let us move on to the Rocat Burst Pro and the Rocat Burst Core aka the Rocat mice with optical switches. So there's this misconception that all mice with optical switches cannot drag click. This is false. Mice with optical switches cannot drag click due to the artificial delays the companies decided to introduce on their mice. So the Rocat Burst Pro has a hold delay of 21 milliseconds and they have a release delay of 21 milliseconds. And theoretically, you can find the max CPS of that mouse. You do 1000 divided by 42 equals 23 CPS. Razer with their mice, on the other hand, decide to hold for 27 milliseconds and release at 27 milliseconds, right? In other words, they have 27 millisecond minimum click duration and 27 millisecond minimum time between clicks. So theoretically, if you do 1000 divided by 54, you can find out that most mice with Razer optical switches will cap out around 18 CPS if you like bulk click or like stereo click. Now let's talk about bloody mice, right? The bloody 60 holds for one millisecond and they release at one millisecond. So theoretically, the max CPS would be 500 in one second. Optical switches can register drag clicks physically, right? But companies just use artificial delays because those switches have the same inherent capabilities as mechanical switches, right? When companies say that these switches don't double click, they refer to the switch not being broken, you know, unintentional double clicking. So let's talk about glorious mice. So glorious mice have a debounce setting multiplied by 1.5. In other words, to calculate the hold and release delay, say you have like a 4ms debounce time, right? You multiply that by 1.5 and you find out that the hold um, delay is 6 milliseconds and the release delay is 6 milliseconds. If you add those two together, you can find now the max CPS the Mata O wire can get. So you do a thousand divided by 12 to get around 83 max CPS. To summarize, right, TDLR, we have to look at the total hold and release delays, whether it be like 6 and 6, or like 22 and 22, or like 27 and 27, in order to determine whether a mouse is good at drag clicking or not. And this can be determined via testing. It turns out that Pwn H mice on 2 MS debounce time has the same amount of debounce as Glorious on 4 MS debounce setting. Why is that? As you know, not all mice debounce the same. Some mice just 
have different softwares. So as a result, when someone says, like this mouse has two MSD bounce time, therefore it's better than a mouse with four MSD bounce time, you need to recognize that it isn't true, right? We have to calculate the holding release delays to truly understand whether a mouse is good for drag clicking or not. There's another thing to be noted. Firmware changes can also affect debounce time and hold and release delays. Corsair mice actually lower debouncing on newer firmware for certain mice. I think it happened to like the M65 and M55, while Steel Series actually increases the bouncing on newer firmwares. For example, the Steel Series Rival 600. And as you can see, the Gloris Mono O wireless used to not be able to drag click because like their firmware messed up their debouncing. And as a result of a firmware update, you're able to change your debounce time. Another thing that affects debouncing and how a click is registered is polling rate. Polling rate is how long a mouse basically checks for a click, right? The more polling rate, the better registration of clicks. So 125 hertz polling rates means that you register clicks every eight milliseconds, right? That's the cap. And a thousand hertz means that you'll register clicks every one millisecond, meaning that it's eight times smaller than 125 hertz. So theoretically, if you have a mouse with a high polling rate and with good software, you would be able to drag click way more CPS compared to a mouse with a thousand hertz. So if you want a mouse for drag clicking, I made a tier list, I'll link it over here. Anyway, I hope you understood the science behind this video. I don't know if you did, but if you do enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, and share. Yeah, this is the only video that I want you to share. I never said that before. Anyway, I hope you found this helpful, and I'm probably going to make an updated video on this in a few months also, because drag clicking is a learning process, right? It's like a science. As you dig more into it, you are able to discover things that you never knew existed. So, happy drag clicking.